Welcome everyone. My name is Marcy Peterson. I'm the Marketing Technology Director at Wheaton Arts. And this year, Wheaton Arts marked its 50th anniversary. And we would like to let you know that there are a few ways that you can help support Wheaton Arts and free programs like this evening's programs at program. And that is through membership, donations, and shop.wheatonarts. Uh, I also will chat in the next Wheaton Conversation Bolivia Ritual, Bolivian Ritual and Dance, um, and that is the next one coming up. So be sure to sign up and keep in touch. And it's my pleasure now to inter introduce Kristen Qualls. Kristen will monitor this entire evening. She will be your voice as this is a webinar and um, she will ask the questions as you ask them. Um, however, some of them will be reserved for the close of the evening after the presentation. So over to you, Kristen, enjoy everyone. Great, thank you so much, Marcy. I am pleased to be able to introduce our two guests for tonight. We have Dr. Catherine Whalen. She is an associate professor at Bard Graduate Center and the founding director of the Bard Graduate Center Craft, Art and Design Oral History Project, which is an online archive of contemporary makers um, for which this uh, fantastic project, the Voices in Studio Glass History from the Paul Hollister Archives fits in perfectly. Uh, we also have with us Barb Alam. She's the Associate Director of Visual Media Resources and the Study Collection Librarian at the Bard Graduate Center. She has a background in archives and collections management um, of art collections, and she's very active in the VRA, which is the Visual Resources Association. Um, they are both co-curators and developers of um, this incredible multimedia um, repository website, um, online exhibition that um, the core of which is based out of Paul Hollister's writings and um, photographs. And I'm very excited to uh, talk with them about that project and how they worked on it and what we've learned. Um, so this project is actually the merging of two projects. Um, that started with um, Irene Hollister, um, who is the um, wife and then widow of Paul Hollister, who we're going to be talking about today. And Paul Hollister was a significant um, glass uh, historian and writer and critic, um, and who is best known for his work initially on the history of paperweights. Um, and that's something that Barb will be talking about a bit later, especially in reference to Wheaton. Um, but in the, in the 1970s, he got really interested in studio glass. And um, one of the people we'll also be talking about, Paul Stankard, was a real bridge, right? Between this interest in paperweights and this interest in studio glass and that he was an active in both realms. Um, to, to say a bit more about Irene, um, this project would not exist without her. She uh, was um, uh, a successful career woman in her own right, the founding administrator of the American um, Computing Machinery Association, um, and essentially the breadwinner um, in the family. She also encouraged him to, um, to write the Encyclopedia Paperweights. Um, and, and she also recognized, um, you know, in our first conversations, that the, his writings on Studio Glass were not readily available. And, and they hadn't, you know, because they weren't in the book form, um, they hadn't reached the same audience um, as his writing his book on paperweights. Um, and, you know, she was absolutely right. Uh, and these writings um, are a really important resource uh, for understanding uh, studio glass history, um, particularly in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, they were published in relatively difficult to find um, magazines and journals. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so, uh, you know, I think her vision was really critical uh, in, in um, you know, her commitment to bringing these materials to light. She also donated other kinds of archival materials, including um, an amazing slide collection to Bard Graduate Center, um, where he taught in the early 1990s, and, and Barb will talk more about that. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, 
Okay. Um, so one of the driving forces behind the digital exhibition project is a teaching collection of 17,000 slides taken or collected by Paul Hollister that were given to the Bar Graduate Center by Irene Hollister after Paul's passing. These slides are part of the VMR department, which I oversee. And you can see in this slide here, the, the before and after of archiving on the left, of course, is before and on the right is after. Um, Paul Hollister taught glass history during the early days of the Bar Graduate Center. And it became clear a few years into my tenure that these images were really special. Um, Irene corresponded with me several times and wanted to know um, how many slides were originals? Um, how many slides did Paul Hollister take himself? So right away, I knew that these were important, but also through the five years of working on this project, it really is a gift to see this material. Um, it's, it's not only sort of a, a opening up uh, Paul Hollister's brain, um, but also it's just a history of so many of these glass artists, studio glass artists and paperweight artists, lots of techniques. And it's just really, really been interesting to me. Um, in 2016, we began talking internally about putting together some kind of of site to showcase these original images. And we decided to focus on about 200 of them. And these were slides of artists at work, um, often giving demonstrations, um, occasionally uh, in their own studios, um, at, at events, um, et cetera. Many of the slides featured glass centers at a particular moment in time, such as the Penland School of Craft, of course, Wheaton, uh, and the New York Experimental Glass Workshop. There are also images of things like glass factories. There are quite a few images of Blanco Glass Company in, Mil in, in uh, West Virginia, Milton, West Virginia, for example. Um, some of our, one of our initial steps was completing a general inventory of the collection. And then we began digitizing and cataloging the original images. And I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the slide um, on the screen there, um, but it is actually a Wheaton slide. Um, and uh, we had, um, Luckily, we had this uh, great uh, work study student, Anna Matisse Donifer Hickey, who is the daughter of um, studio glass artist Laura Donifer, um, to help us um, catalog some of the original slides. Um, so that I think that's quite interesting. Um, Catherine and I were talking this morning, and we I think we had about around twenty or so work study students that helped us throughout this entire process um, at the at our graduate center. Um, okay, moving on. Um, we started interviewing people that were in the slides. Um, that was kind of a first step, um, partially to ID them, but also as a jumping off point to stories about the locations and the culture of the glass community at the time the photos were taken. And I was looking at this slide earlier today and realized I'd interviewed all but two people in the slide, so quite a few people. Um, the first interviews we did, the very first one um, was with Paul Stankard and there are a couple of it, one image of him and one image of his early honeybee experiments and both these slides actually aren't in the project, um, so I wanted to bring bring them out because um, I really love the, the, the slides of the experiments I think it's quite quite cool. Um, and we also interviewed William Morris, um, who used to be the chief gaffer of Dale Tahuli, and then he became a well-known uh, studio glass artist in his own right. And he is in the center on the left image and on the right side on the bench. In 2018, the entire collection was archived and you saw the before and after photos of that. And we transitioned from only interviewing people in the slides to people connected either to Hollister, to the history of Studio Glass. And at this time, Catherine's project, which is an anthology of Hollister's writings, which she'll be talking about in a minute when we show the, show the site, um, merged with the slide project. So it became two projects, really, this exhibition that I was working on and Catherine's project that, was the, that is the anthology of Hollister's writings. Um, we then took a trip to the Corny Museum of Glass and visited the Ray Cow Library, where we were very fortunate to have been very welcomed by all the librarians there and listened, and we were able to listen to a collection of rec recently digitized and never before heard interviews that Paul Hollister conducted with glass artists and members of the studio glass community. The Ray, the Ray Cow allowed us to listen and transcribe any of the recordings we wanted. And over time, we were able to transcribe about 30 of those. And we ended up publishing 20. Um, the reason why we didn't use them all is just because the audio quality wasn't very good on all of them. But in every case, we used something. Um, so we were really, really fortunate to have that. And it, you can see here in the slide, sort of half of the project were these current interviews. And then the other, the other half was the, were these leg legacy interviews um, from the Ray Cow. Okay, 
And um, we ended up interviewing about 50 glass artists and glass community members throughout the project. And this is just an example of just, just a few of them to give you kind of a taste of who we talked to. And we were fortunate to have conducted a number of interviews in person, both in audio and video, but we also did a very large number over the phone. And in some cases we did them in, excuse me, in more than one format. So with Paul Stankard, who's here in this photo on the top, we did a, an early interview with him, as I mentioned before, on the phone, and then we followed up with a video interview later. And in the case of Jane Bruce on the bottom here, we did both an audio interview with her in person and then a video interview in person, and we, we used all of that material. Um, this is um, Jesse Mirandi with me. Um, Jesse is a third partner in the project. He was responsible for the web component of the site. Um, here we are with a very early paper, paper uh, prototype, um, and this is uh, back in 2018. And fast forward to 2020, um, we, have, we had started working with our developers um, who are called Chips. Um, our website is uh, WordPress based for anybody who's interested in that. Um, Chips had already put together some promo pages for us and uh, Jesse became really interested um, through Catherine really with seeing all these great craft magazines that Paul Hollister had written feature articles in, um, not just the covers, but the entire layout. And so he was really interested in um, start, uh, emulating this uh, for the site's design. So he asked Chips to use this as sort of inspiration. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from here to the site itself. Okay, all right. Um, so I'm gonna start with, well, actually, I'm going to start with kind of a unique feature of this site, and I hope I can move away my little panel here so I can get to this part. But um, one thing that is just sort of a fun, uh, I guess, uh, feature of the site is every time you open it, um, you get a different image. Um, there are actually seven different um, home pages. Um, and this was a feature that we kind of worked on for a while with chips, and I thought it worked out really well. We were excited about it. Um, and if anybody, again, if anybody has questions as we go along, um, please ask. Um, and we're gonna now go to the, the annotated bibliography, the Paul Hollister annotated bibliography. I'm gonna show you one or two um, uh, images uh, from the bibliography, but I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine to talk a little bit more about that. Catherine. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Barb. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, Hollister wrote for a range of um, publications, um, you know, really primarily in the 1970s and 80s. And, and these were involved in a sense in a time where the studio glass market and sort of the kind of um, estimations of its aesthetic and cultural value, as well as its economic value are really in formation. Uh, and he was a, a big part of that. And specifically through uh, this bibliography takes about is about 90 entries. Most of those are his writing, and then and there's a few examples of writings about him. But a third of these he wrote for the New York Times. And at that time, they didn't appear in the art section, they appeared in the home section. So, you know, they're side by side with advertisements for mattresses or your summer garden furniture. Um, but they were incredibly influential because people were not familiar with this work in this medium. And the gallerist Doug Heller tells stories about people, um, you know, clipping them out of the newspaper, bringing them to his gallery, which was one of the first galleries in New York to show um, contemporary studio glass and saying, I don't know anything about this, but I want to see it. And then th those became, you know, clients, right? And, and, and that was really important for, uh, you know, reaching a large audience or at least an audience of New York Times readers. Uh, some of his other publications are more specialized, um, you know, specifically the Noise Glass, um, which starts um, a publication that starts in Germany in 1980, is published in English and French. Um, but there's also some, a whole range of publications in between, including the American Craft Magazine that some of you may be familiar with. Um, and then also this magazine, Collector's Editions that he wrote very early on which you know, had everything from studio glass to humble figures, um, you know, to how do you collect um, cap guns, right? So it's, it's, he is able to reach all different kinds of audiences. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about his writing. And he, he also talks about, you know, it's different to write for different publications. You know, New York Times, no adjectives. Collector's editions, metaphors abound. You know, if something's pantyhose pink, 
it's going to call it pantyhose pink. <laughs> uh, so, um, it, you know, the difference kind of in the way in which, you know, one of the things I think that's interesting is, is the way in which a critic uh, himself or herself, right, um, decides how to write about something and then how a magazine or another kind of publication decides uh, what that writing should be. Uh, Barb's showing a great example here. I mean, illustrations were really, really important um, to him and to these, to many of these publications, um, and especially in these earlier publications like collector's editions. Uh, there's mention of prices, um, and that's actually something that's really hard to find. Uh, so again, in these earlier editions, you know, he might talk about how the, you know this here's a show at Habitat Galleries. Here's how much this item costs, right? You don't see that um, in the later publications. Uh, so that's one of the reasons these early publications are such a great resource. I think Henry Hallam might be here, so I'm going to show this too. Hey, Henry. Um, yeah. Hi, Henry, if you are here. Um, I, I wanted to also mention this mentioned area. Or Catherine, do you want to talk about this? Some of these are longer than others, but what this is. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I, mean, I think one of the things, um, you know, Barb and I and Jesse talked a lot about is like, how do we connect different pieces of the site, especially because it sort of started as two projects, right? The anthology was originally going to be a book print project, right? And then the exhibition and the image archives uh, was a separate project. But I actually think we, we, Barb and I both see them as archival projects, right, using different materials. So one is about these writings, and one is about these incredible number of interviews that Barb has done and these transcripts. Um, and so we wanted to be able to cross between the two, um, and Barb will show that on some other pages. So for example, so, um, we wanted to make, if um, a particular artist was mentioned or a particular place was mentioned, we wanted to have a hyperlink. So you could get there, right? And then, you know, kind of vice versa, you could get here from other places. Um, and then again, I think as Barb showed you, you can download the full article uh, and, and, you know, read in detail. Um, so that's kind of, those are, I think, the main features of this section. Yeah, and you can, and you can link, this links back to our, our artist community page, our Glass community page. So if you want to find out about Mark Pizer because he was mentioned in this article, you can click here and go right to his page. I'm not going to do that because we're going to navigate completely away. Um, and if Henry is here, I should probably show this. I'd love to. And what a great cover. Um, again, this is collector's editions, but um, so, so anyway, a lot of material to peruse. Um, but we'll uh, we'll move on to the transcripts portion. And I also um, wanted to say to um, uh, the curator of, of modern Con and contemporary glass at, at Corning, um, Susie Silbert, worked on this uh, project with Catherine very early on. Um, and later on, um, Colleen Terrell, who is also, they're both BGC alums, worked on this, on this project with Catherine, um, independently of me. Um, and I'm going to go next to uh, the transcripts. You can find um, those 20 transcripts that I mentioned earlier. You can find them all here. Um, and I'm going to sort of show you how this works. So you just click on a transcript. Let's find one here. Um, here's one of Klaus uh, Moyer from 1984. And click on the transcript. And you get information such as a sort of nice bio here a summary of the entire uh, transcript, and then also the, the same kinds of mentions that we have in the um, in the annotated bibliography. So you can click to various people that are part of the project here. Um, and then the whole transcript is here. And some of these were very long. I mean, this one is 50 pages. I think there were some that were even more. Um, this also included uh, not just interviews that Hollister did himself, but interviews that people did for Paul Hollister. So we have an interview with Flora Mason, Joy Kirkpatrick, where they sent in a recording for him. He, I'm assuming he asked the questions ahead of time. Dan Daly, same thing, John Kuhn. So there was a lot of that. And also just recordings that he made at lectures. So um, Carol Cohen, for example. Even in the course of Hollister's lifetime and his conversations with artists, they said, well, you know, you have these tapes and the articles, you know, can you publish these in the book? And and you know, so the idea was there certainly long before we we did this project. Do you want to talk about this, Catherine? This little uh, bit of dialogue here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think exactly what I said. You know, um, it's it's kind of this question. I mean, there's a recognition, and this is pretty early on, eighty five, that this is really valuable material, 
Um, and, and he also has a con Paul has a conversation with Paul Sankard about saying, you know, you know, isn't this historically significant? A hundred years from now, aren't, aren't going to people people are going to know about this? And you know, I mean, I think part of what Hollister's response here is this: the difficulty, right, of of um, publishing, republishing, um, especially getting you know good color illustrations. Um, I think he felt very strongly that you know it wasn't just the writings but it was also about the work and that you needed to see the work would you agree barb yeah i do it and it I, and i also thought it was great to uncover this material i mean and i'm typing away transcribing it oh this is amazing this is exactly what we want to hear um and it came up more than once that he talked about um wanting to do something with these uh with the articles and with the recordings and you know where where would he deposit them and so on. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to, well, I'll, I'll really quick do the glass community because I think everybody needs to take a look at that. And then we've, and I know we've been, um, well here, I'll explain what this is first. Um, so this is um, all of the artists, scholars and glass community members that are, were part of the project. Um, so they were either the artists or glass community, community members that we interviewed or they were artists that were featured in feature articles that Paul Hollister wrote. So some of these people are deceased. Um, a lot of them aren't, um, uh, but that's that's sort of why Francis and Michael Higgins are here, even though they're deceased and we of course didn't get to talk to them, but other people that are very much living are here. Um, so uh, this is basically how it works is you pick a person and we've been talking about Paul Stankard, so we'll pick him. Um, and usually there's a photo if we were able to get one, a little bio and then some images of their work and then any sort of archival media that we had. So whether or not we used every video on various pages that included Paul Stankard, if we weren't able to use a video, we put it in here. So it's both the videos we used and that we weren't able to use. Um, same thing with the audio. So there's quite a bit of audio here. And then also there's a bibliography. So if there are articles related to the person, they're here. Um, and uh, soon we're actually gonna put those transcripts down here too. That's something that our developers are still working on. There's a few little, little fixes and kinks that we're working out, but that's what that page is about. Um, and I'm not sure if I can go back one and yeah, I was just going to see if I can show you just one more example. We'll do Dan Daly. Um, again, same, same kind of, kind of deal, but in this case, we only did an audio interview. So that's why it's like this. And here's a bibliography where, you, where you're not seeing the video. Um, let's go ahead and move on to, um, the places of Studio Glass. Um, so these are the place pages that we have. There are seven. Um, so, and I'll quickly go through them. There's Penland School Craft, the Corning Museum of Glass, of course, Wheaton, uh, Wheaton Arts Cultural Center, um, RISD, Urban Glass, which used to be New York Experimental Glass Workshop, and uh, Blinko Glass Company, and Pilchuck. Um, the reason that we chose these uh, glass centers um, was because Paul Hollister um, had some kind of a relationship with them, whether it was he did interviews at the location, he took lots of photographs, um, he visited frequently, um, the place was very important to him, for example, Corning. Um, these are why we chose these. Um, we probably could have chose a lot more. Um, we keep thinking somebody's going to tell us a certain institution should have been here, and you were probably right. Um, but we we had to sort of put the, the stop somewhere, but these are the ones that we selected. Um, and I think, it, I think it works pretty well. Um, well I am gonna show you the Wheaton page and hopefully in its entirety, um, but I wanted to start with Penland to just give you an idea of kind of the layout of the pages and just some of the features of all of the, all of the pages really. And I'm gonna move on all our screens out of the way here so you can all see this. So every place, every uh, place page has a navigation. I don't, I'm hopefully you can see my uh, cursor here, but on the, on the right hand corner, and this is something that Catherine really felt strongly about and, and very much rightly because these pages are very long and so you can easily get lost in them. So it's good to have sort of a, a, a place to go if you're interested in a, a certain aspect of the page. Um, we also we we got a lot of great photos from a lot of these locations. We were really lucky. Every um, place page has an introduction, um, uh, followed by a sort of mapping of the page, so you can find out, for example, what interviews were were 
conducted by us? What, inter what interviews did Paul Hollister do? Um, what articles are here? Are there any transcripts? Just so that you can kind of navigate yourself or, or before you even start moving through um, what you're gonna be seeing. Um, and just a little bit about how this works. So um, oftentimes we have these article boxes where you can kind of toggle here and start. Oh, it's just, you know, it, 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 you it did work for yeah. hours about why Pamela. I don't know if you can he hear this, but uh, this is Ken Carter. Uh, especially, you know, talking it's, about Pamela. It's, uh, involvement of bill bill and jane brown there's know, a the we have 60s, transcripts for everything so you can know, follow so along with, if you'd like to uh, um you know the, certainly no the requirement with that but i think it is helpful um to have these with, and we have them for uh, audio and video the whole 60s I, um and we'll okay we're gonna Actually, maybe I will just explain to you that we also have video and you're probably already familiar with the way this works or you can come scroll down over here and then again, there are transcripts to everything so we have. Um, multiple video um, a multi video or single video single audio or multi audio and so on. Um, I'm going to go back to the top. Actually, there's a navigation tool to get back to the top. We're almost there um, and I'm going to quickly go through. Um, Paul Stankard's 1986 workshop. Um, the reason why I'm doing that is because um, Paul, Paul Stankard did a very uh, famous workshop where he revealed the secrets of flame working and, and encasing uh, flame worked components into clear glass and a paperweight um, in 1986. And this was really the first time um, an artist uh, had shown this technique uh, definitely at this scale, which was a several day workshop, um, or really at all. Um, there were there were some demos here and there, um, much, much shorter that were given, but this was really the first time where a lot of studio glass artists and even paperweight artists um, had ever seen these techniques being done. Um, so it was really um, sort of an unprecedented, really important workshop. Um, and one of the things, this is one of Catherine's ideas, which I thought worked really well, was this idea of even if you can get to the article later, just having full pages or spreads of some of these articles, just visually, it looks nice. And you can also start to read these as you go. So just kind of incorporating some of this material into these pages, again, with these videos and the transcripts and also these article boxes. So again, you can find these articles on Paul Stankard's page, but you can also find them here which we thought was really helpful. Here's a Paul Hollister slide here. So, you know, incorporating his slides into all these pages, of course. Um, this is a, an advertisement for that, that uh, the class. Um, we were really lucky to get a, uh, some uh, video that was, um, that was actually filmed in 1986 at the actual workshop. Um, and we used a bunch of excerpts of it for the site. Um, so that's here um, again. Um, more uh, audio and in some cases it's actually Paul Hollister's um, interviews, which is uh, or um, interview or in this case, um, uh, this was the actual recording of the workshop, which was really cool. Um, for this, um, this was a feature that I, I really st felt strongly about doing, which is that um, we had a lot of people we interviewed, as I mentioned earlier, helped us label these slides. And then in, in, in turn, we ended, we ended up interviewing a lot of these people, which was really wonderful. Um, and so we talked to the developers about creating something where um, we would use these overlays and then we could play um, an audio that the person who was speaking will will light up. And that was that was uh, really important to me. But. I mean, just to say this was one of the really great things about collaborating, uh, you know, because when Barb proposed this, uh, Jesse and I were like, wow, that's a lot of work. Do we really need to do that, blah, blah, blah. And then and Barb was like, yeah, we really do. And we did. <laughs> and she was right. Um, so I think that's one of the great things about working, um, you know, collaboratively. I, and I feel the same, Catherine, because there's so many ideas that like with your articles or so many ideas that you had as well and Jesse as well. And I think we really worked well together on this and it all hopefully to the viewers out there, um, hopefully it, it some, is something that's useful for you. I also was really interested in doing pull quotes and so many times somebody would say something and I'm like, oh, oh, I really want that to be something that everybody can sort of read quickly um, right when they're on the site because it's um, just some really wonderful wonderful statements and so we did that so i just wanted to to say a little bit more about the um i'm sorry i'm going through a little quickly but about the um 
the workshop, um, which is that, you know, like I said, it's a really, it was a very big deal. And also um, Paul Hollister was invited by Paul Stanker to attend and Paul Hollister really loved it. You can see him uh, here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but he, Paul Hollister is in the background. In some cases, um, we don't know if he set up a tripod and, and photographed himself. Um, they, these were all in his hands. So we really don't know for sure, but we're attributing them. If, if we think we did, he did them, yes, it, the photos. If we were not sure, we're not attribute, attributing them to him, but we know that these were in his collection. Um, so we're just not sure. But um, I wanted to just show you that he, um, not only did he participate, but he, um, he made a, a piece that Paul Stankard really loved. And so I um, just wanted to really quickly show you that. It's, it's now in the collection of Corning. Oh, I'm not going too far. Oh, this is, this is a Millville Rose crimp from you guys, Kristen. Yeah, I was gonna say, I see the Millville Rose and that's um, really exciting that, you know, that, that um, pattern was, was made out at the Spillcheck, um, I'm sorry, Penland um, workshop. Yeah, I should I should scroll up a little bit here. Um, that yes, um, Gary Beecham, one of the artists that uh, was that attended this, made a Millville Rose, uh, who I'm sure a lot of you out there from Wheaton uh, are familiar with, um, using um, one of the attendees' uh, crimps. And so we thought it was important to show what a, Mil a Millville Rose crimp looks like, and we were lucky that um, that we were able to get one from you from from you guys at Wheaton. Um, and I didn't know a lot until we went to visit you at, um, at Wheaton, Kristen. So that was really wonderful. We'll talk about that in a minute when we get to the Wheaton page, but we were able to, to visit Wheaton and it was very, very helpful for us. Extremely, really, it's really great. Um, so this is Paul um, Hollister um, trying his hand at flame working, um, which I, I really love this photo. Um, and just some great quotes um, from Paul Stanker, Donovan Bouts. Donovan Bouts is here on the right. Um, who was a bead maker, but is also, um, a, he's a glass goblet maker. Um, and his father was very known in the glass world as well. And this is Paul Hollister's um, glass plaque that he made that um, that Paul Stankard was um, very interested in because it combined a lot of different techniques that weren't normally combined. So I thought that was very sweet. Um, so I'm gonna keep moving and I'm gonna go on into the, um, please, yeah. We're going to go into the Wheaton page now. And as I mentioned, um, Catherine and I were very lucky to have been allowed to come to Wheaton um, and get a great tour from Kristen um, and get a look around, uh, look in the museum, great look at the museum and at the archives. Um, we also spoke to Diane Wood, who's the curatorial assistant there. And um, we got right away a huge amount of um, a collection of images um, that you said, just use whatever you want, which was amazing. Um, we ended up using, I think about 50 images from you guys, which is, a, which is a lot, you know, and it was very, very, very helpful. So thank you so much. So again, same, same kind of thing. Uh, there's an introduction information about um, who is uh, in these interviews. Um, I should, I should mention um, the kind of the main people we talked to about this, these pages are Kristen, of course, um, Gay, Gay LeClaire Taylor, who I think is here tonight, um, who uh, was the former um, curator and director of the museum. I'm hoping I'm getting the, the title correct. Um, and her husband, Barry, um, oversaw the entire um, uh, Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center back when it was Wheaton Village. Um, we also talked uh, to Hank Adams, um, uh, who talked to us mostly about Blanco Glass Company as he was a designer there. Um, but he also talked a little bit about weed and we got some good um, material from him about that. Um, and we also interviewed quite a few um, paperweight artists for this page. Um, Debbie Tarsitano, Gordon Smith, who I'm hoping both of them are here tonight, Victor Trabuco, um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting other people. Well, of course, Paul Stankard, um, but we'll get to that part of the, of the um, oh, Bob Bamford, of course. And we'll get to that part of the um, page in just a moment. Um, again, these are some of the great um, archival slides that we got of uh, Wheaton, Wheaton when it was back when it was Wheaton Village. Um, images of the original factory and the, um, the replica factory, um, the glass studio, the, amp the amphitheater. Um, great quote from Kristen about um, Corning, um, about, about the amphitheater um, being the first, the first of its kind and Corning um, 
was sent there to take a look and, and um, create their own. Um, we have some Hollister slides here of the glass studio and then a, a contemporary image. I'll try to go quickly. Um, great um, clips here from both Gay and Kristen. Um, I really was interested in these historic molds that you guys have. And um, I, of course, became interested after seeing so many Hollister slides of the molds. And, um, you know, I remember asking Gay, so wait, what, what are these and where are, where are they? And um, why are they important and so on? And, um, and, it, and so we learned a lot about these molds, how important they are to Wheaton and to their history and where you got them. And this, all this information is in here. Also that they're used, um, they continue to be used. Um, and you can see artist Beth Lipman using some a, a historic press for an event here. So all this equipment gets used. Um, but, uh, and I'm gonna move on now to the Paperweight Weekend, which was a, a big part of kind of why we came to Wheaton um, because we had um, some slides of, of the 1986 paperweight weekend um, that were taken by Paul Hollister. And Paul Hollister, as uh, Catherine mentioned earlier, um, wrote this very influential book called The Encyclopedia of Glass Paperweights. Um, there's two images of that here. Um, we talked to Gay about uh, extensively about Paul um, and about that book. I'm hoping that this will work because this is a great quote. We're going to try to see if it will. If it doesn't, we'll have to move on. But what happened is, yeah. is Paul Hollister uh, devised a book where he really looked at the Millefiori canes and realized if you knew a star that had five points, well, that could be Baccarat. If something had six points, that could be San Luis or the New England Glass Company in Boston. So he started to draw those canes. So these collectors that are out there today have their jeweler's loops and they're looking in their weights and they're identifying every single thing. And then there's the whole contemporary glass artist field uh, of artists that are making contemporary paperweights that are just extraordinary with flamework designs on the inside. I will stop it there, but um, so we have a lot of great clips like that um, that you can peruse on your own. Here's another Millville Rose, um, and this is also from the Museum of American Glass. Um, we could even play Kristen's, uh, oh, why, don't, why don't we play it for a minute? The Millville Rose um, comes from Millville. So Ralph Barber, who was most well known within the glass blowing world as excellent x-ray tube maker. So again, this is an example of that factory worker who's brought up through the apprentice system and, and learns from the factory from making these utilitarian items. And then on his off time, creates this paperweight motif. He was also a rose gardener. So it was, you know, for him, I can imagine it was, he loves roses. Can I make a rose paperweight and develops this crimp that allows you to blossom the rose as you're rounding out the paperweight. Okay. So more clips like that. And just uh, just wanted to briefly mention, in case you don't know about the Paperweight Weekend, um, it still happens. Um, this is a weekend that um, has traditionally be, been attended by paperweight makers um, and collectors. Um, uh, this is the very first one, which was in 1975. And uh, Paul Stankard is here in the very 70s pants here. Um, Barry Taylor, um, the director of the of Wheaton at the time is in the back here. Um, Bob Bamford is here. Pretty much everybody here um, was definitely at the time a name in paperweights. I think a lot of them are now uh, passed away. Um, and this is um, Frank Wheaton Jr. That's correct, right, Kristen? Okay. Yes. She's nodding yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. He, found, he founded um, Wheaton Arts, then Wheaton, Wheaton Village. Yeah, yeah. So great photo. And I got that one from Gay um, really early on. Some information about the Paperweight Collectors Association and the very short-lived American Paperweight Guild. Um, if you have a chance, you should read it. it is, it's quite an interesting um, sto story. Um, more interviews. Um, an early image of Gay here on the right. Um, during her tenure um, at the museum. And then this is Paul Hollister on the left here um, and Bob Bamford and his father, Ray. And I interviewed Bob and Ray has since passed away. Um, and uh, Paul Hollister also interviewed Bob and Ray too in another um, a lot, sort of longer interview in, in an exhibition, which we, which we have. Um, this uh, Festival of Dames, this, what I found this really interesting. Um, the Paperweight Weekend, um, 
and uh, underwent a number of name changes. It was the collector's weekend, paperweight collector's weekend, paperweight weekend, it's now paperweight fest. Um, and at one point it was given the title um, small scale works or small scale sculpture. Um, and this uh, was something that Debbie Tarsitano um, sort of uh, came up with. And it was the idea of sort of, you know, again, moving into contemporary uh, paperweights. So instead of paperweights just being uh, paperweights um, as sort of the traditional um, round ball, the idea of moving into something that's more sculptural um, and calling it something different. Um, this didn't take off. Um, a lot of the paperweight artists weren't interested in, in their craft being called something different. So it never it never sort of came to be, but I, I do like the idea and I thought it was interesting and definitely bold. So I thought that was cool. Um, so more about that. There's Debbie Tarsitano there. And again, I mentioned that um, the paperweight weekends um, still go on. This is from 2018. Um, you can see uh, Paul Stankard here. Um, Hank Adams is actually in the back here. Um, I was really, really happy to find out that this is Charles Kazian the third. Um, Charles Kazian the second was considered sort of the dean of modern paperweights, and I'll show you him in a minute. But um, I actually had no idea that Charles Kazian the third was even making paperweights. Um, who knows? Maybe he's out there in the audience. But I thought that was great, so I was really happy to see that. Um, and then we have Paul. Um, Stankard on the right here and Rick Ayot, who um, makes work um, and his daughter, Melissa, um, also makes work in the same studio and it's very, very good. Um, so quite interesting. And this is the 1986 Paperweight Weekend. So this is really where Paul Hollister um, comes in, although he's he's attending all along, but this this is where this, there's a, there's a photo, a couple photos that I'll be showing you in a minute um, that he, we believe that he took. And so we wanted to focus on that 86 weekend. Um, one thing that's really interesting about that weekend, um, and I'll talk about, hopefully I'll be able to ch chance to talk about these lectures too. One thing that was interesting about the weekend is that he, uh, Paul Stankard showed those uh, flame working techniques as sort of um, like a mini workshop before the big workshop at Penland. And it was a month before. So we really wanted to make sure that we had both the early workshop and then the bigger workshop. So that's so that's why we have um, information about those. Um, we were really lucky that um, Diane and Kristen pulled out the, this material here, which is that 1986 Paperweight Weekend um, brochure. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the information about the panel discussions and just the evening. And I was really surprised at what a big deal these uh, weekends are. It's they they weren't just sort of a weekend picnic, you know, uh, hobbyist sort of thing. They were really serious and they were expensive and people uh, people paid to uh, to hear the speakers and see the demonstrations. Um, I mean, just looking at the menu, lobster bisque, baked Alaska, I mean, this was serious. Um, and and um, I thought that was telling. And also, um, I should mention too, Paul Hollister was on a panel for this, uh, this, uh, hall this weekend. Um, and on the panel, the, the keynote um, was, um, was Dwight Lamon, who at the time, um, I believe at the time that he did the panel, he was the director of Corning and Catherine may know that, um, but, but um, he, he eventually definitely was the director of Corning and went to Thur, um, uh, but he gave this lecture um, that, that was about um, paperweights from the Great Paperweight Show, which was at the Corning Museum of Glass. And the Great Paperweight Show was co-curated by Paul Hollister. Um, Paul Hollister uh, worked very uh, closely with Dwight Lemon on the catalog, which was called Flowers Which Clothe, Clothe the Meadows, which is here on the right. Um, there's more information about this show if you're interested in on the Corning page. There's lots of great photographs um, of the show itself. Um, we probably won't have time to look at them, but um, I think uh, Marcy's sending the link um, so you can all take a look at the site yourself. Um, I should also say that um, if you're going to the link, especially if you're looking at it now, I don't know when the link is being sent. Um, we're having some problems with Chrome. So don't use Chrome, use another another browser um, and then it should work for you. But we're having some problems with Chrome at the moment. Okay, so this is kind of the creme de la creme of the whole thing. So I really wanted to um, show you, show everybody this. Um, so this, um, it, it's the same concept as the as the other, um, the other feature that I showed you. Um, but uh, this, this was a slide of the, uh, 
the attendees of the paperweight weekend, the, the makers, um, the paperweight makers. And um, it's the same idea. Um, again, I'm gonna move people out of the way so I can show you how this works. Um, so hopefully this will work, but here's That's Debbie. The first one that I attended, Wheaton Village would have it one year and then the opposite year would be Paperweight Collectors Association Convention. And I started to go to this event from Wheaton Village. It started as the, um, I, I, I could be wrong, but this is what I recall. It started as the American Paperweight Association. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. Um, so the idea was you could go through this and click on these well, and if the they were, who, uh, if, 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 for instance, Debbie, she's talking about kind of her own involvement, she would be highlighted. Torch, but if, but if a, Bob Banford and Gordon Smith started talking about Charles Kazian and his son, then all them, all, all the individuals would be lit up. So, was, so I wanted this to be sort of like a dialogue where people were talking about people that they knew. Um, in some cases, it might be Kristen talking about Gordon Smith. So. Kristen will be talking and then Gordon Smith will be lit up. Um, or Gay Taylor will be talking about, about um, Doug Merritt and Barry Sautner or something like that. But I, I did want this kind of dialogue to happen. Um, and so let's see if I can find one towards the end where this happens, where again, where you can sort of see, um, yeah, so Bob Bamford yeah, Bobby Hansen, he talking about. Made, and I knew his father, Ron, and became friendly with him. And Ron had passed away at this point, and Bobby was going to try and make paperweights himself. Yeah, so so we really love that feature. Um, I do, and um, I hope that you have fun with it, taking a look. Um, okay, paperweight exemplars and uh, innovations, um, some images of other art, of artists' works. Um, I just wanted to very briefly mention this because one of the things that um, is interesting about Paul Hollister and Paul Stankard is that Paul Hollister really felt that Paul Stankard was bridging the gap between paperweights and studio glass. Um, not only because of his you know, workshop, but also his forms. Um, he really liked the idea that Paul Stankard wasn't just making a round ball, but that he was moving into other shapes and that the works were becoming sculptural. So this is called a cloistered botanical uh, piece. Um, Paul Hollister actually said to Paul Stankard, I, I think you need to name this series. And he came up with this, um, he suggested that name and he, uh, the Cloistered Botanical, and he, he chose it. Uh, he used it. So um, I thought that was uh, really interesting. And it's brought up a lot. Um, Paul Stankard brings it up himself. Um, but we also have, you know, examples of other people's work. Um, Delmo Tarsitano. One of the things that I thought was great was Alan Kaplan, who is a, a dealer um, who deals in paperweights um, from Leo Kaplan Limited. He talked about how his his um, his mother and sister um, would get the willies and get out a newspaper because the spiders look so real, which I thought was really funny and great. Um, but but again, it's that people there's innovations happening. People are moving uh, towards realism, and and that was. That was something that was happening. Gordon Smith, for sure, is doing the same thing. Uh, speaking of Gordon Smith, here he is on the left doing a demo with John Parsley. So again, there are some demos happening at this point. And Gordon talked a little bit to us about how, you know, some people would, were getting a little angry with him as a really this young guy coming in and, and doing demos because paperweight making was so secretive at that point. Um, and we wanted to emphasize that secrecy and also the sharing and ask people about the secrecy and the sharing. Um, and so um, one of the people that's talked about a lot on this page is Charles Kazian. Um, when in throughout his entire career, he was very, very secretive, the, the most secret modern paperweight artist that there was. Um, and he's talked about it a lot. And Paul Stankard, or sorry, Paul Hollister said, um, he's the, the greatest question dodger that I know, and um, it's very funny, but um, yeah, so moving on from there, um, just to hear some more, some great, a great quote from Debbie Tarsitano um, about, about um, Charles Casey and, you know, working secretively, um, and how it was great when other people weren't working so secretly, but, and we were inviting them, inviting her into their studio. Everybody was secret, don't get me wrong, but um, there was a little bit of, um, of so a little bit of showing here and there um, 
allowing you to, you know, go into, into studios and stuff. We talked to Victor about that extensively too. It was a really great interview. Um, and I should also mention too, and there's quite a bit more on this page, um, we're moving into these artist residencies in the Creative Glass Center of America. Um, I'm gonna scroll, we have a, you can link to transcripts from here, I should say that. You should also, you can link to articles. Um, this is a really great moment of the page, at, at least for me, I thought this was really interesting uh, for Studio Glass is that um, Flora Mace in 1977 came to uh, Wheaton Village um, and she had just graduated from graduate school and she's looking for a place to um, make glass and just really just knocked on the door of Wheaton and they said, okay. And so they built her a little studio and a little bedroom and a shower and so on and let her um, and let her start working. And this was the first time this had really ever happened. So all these studio glass artists are going into universities and coming out of these programs and they have nowhere to go. And Wheaton was really the first place that said, okay, let's make this happen. Um, so Frank Wheaton and I believe his wife and Kristen can correct me, um, were said, let, let's make this happen. Um, and I, I should also mention, we got a lot um, from, from you guys at, at Wheaton, we got s really several images of Flora Mace. I should more than several, I, you know, ten or twelve great images of Flora Mace um, during these early days. And we ended up interviewing Flora Mace and Joy Kirkpatrick, um, along with Laura Donifer, for a kind of a separate program that we have on our, our Pilchuck page. It was a pre-recorded Zoom, um, and uh, we talk about this moment, and we show a lot more of those slides in the video. So if you're interested, go ahead and take a look at that video on, on the uh, Pilchuck page. Um, more from Gay, and this is the very first, um, um, I guess I forgot to, <laughs> I'm going a little bit, uh, skipping ahead here, but um, the Creative Glass Center of America kind of came out of this, uh, of this first initial um, uh, encounter with Flora um, later. And so in, in 1983 was the first um, Creative Glass Center of America. You know what, I might have Kristen talk about it. Um, I was gonna say one thing is, um, is sort of again in that you mentioned the bridge, Paul Stankard kind of being a bridge. Yeah. So Paul Stankard was, was with Frank Wheaton and I think Doug Heller, um, Yes, another big one that was part of really taking what they were seeing, what Flora Mace, for example, was doing, and how do you formalize that into a program that lets these artists come and get the access to the studios so they can really explore their practice since glass is a kind of um, resource heavy material, shall we say. So this gave them the opportunity to, um, you know, really ex prototype, experiment, um, and so that that was formal formalized in 1983, and this image here is uh, the first fellows, plus um, Don Friel, who was um, one of the gaffers at the studio at the time. Um, and we continue to have have the fellowship. So um, uh, unfortunately, with COVID, we had to pause it for a moment. Um, but it will will be back when we can let people <laughs> blow glass safely together from different parts of the country and the world. Um, but we still have. Um, Folks, it's an application, and when you're accepted, you get a stipend, and you live here and get access to the studio. And um, I think another important part of it is that the group, so that the fellows are learning from each other, um, as well as the the staff artists here at at Wheaton, um, as well as from again the history of glass from the South Jersey area, um, as represented in the museum. So. Um, yeah, we're still we're still doing the fellowship, um, and it's it's a fantastic program from the museum side. I'll just note part of it is they give a a piece to the museum that represents what they worked on. They also um, leave notes, uh, sort of a, a notebook of of their process and what they tried, as well as you know some of the images that we were able to share with you. Yep, there's Jim Harmon. Um, so that to me, you know, that's an amazing resource. Um, over thirty years of you know, this collective story of studio glass and what especially emerging or mid-career artists are, are working on. Um, so it's it's a great, great program. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Kristen. Um, I, I shall, should also mention that we did an extensive inter interview um, 
with Jim Harmon as well, um, really for our um, New York Experimental Glass Workshop slash Urban Glass page. So we never even got to Wheaton with him. And then we, of course, we had these great images later, um, but that that uh, I thought was interesting. And I should mention another feature of this, uh, of the pages are these carousels of slides. So if you see a big image and an arrow, go ahead and click on it. Um, and in some cases, not all, um, I'm not sure about these, but in some cases there are quite a few images, at least on our urban glass page that are had never been published. So that, that was kind of cool. I think some of the ones on this page were published, but, um, and speaking of what Kristen was just talking about with the Creative Glass Center of America uh, fellowship program, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about glass weekends, which are these fundraisers. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not well versed in the glass weekends, but the reason why I know about them is that we believe that this 1989 Dan Daly and Lino Teclopietra uh, fellowship took place uh, at a glass weekend. And you can probably hard to see, but it says Glass Lovers Weekend 89, and they are mentioned, um, Lino Teclopietra and Dan Daly um, as, uh, as being uh, participants in the Masterworks program. And Paul Hollister um, took lots of photos of this workshop. And I'm gonna show you the, a little bit of video in, in a second and sort of explain how this all worked. But so this is Dan Daly and Lino Tagliapietra at uh, Wheaton for this joint Masterwork Fellowship. Um, and we know it was in 1989. We think it was at the glass weekend, although we're, we're not quite sure, but I would say I'm about 90% sure. Um, and I had this idea that I wanted to have kind of a narrated slideshow of any of these large sets of slides that Paul Hollister took. Um, and so what I did is I interviewed um, Dan Daly um, and Lino Tagliapietra in it. Uh, I had, uh, we had a student who, it was Italian. And so she spoke to Lino in Italian, tra transcribed it and translated it for us. And then we, uh, we use some of the some of that uh, in these interviews, uh, a couple interviews with Lino, a couple of videos that we used, um, and I'll play a little of this. And so um, I asked him if he wanted to make some things in collaboration, because talking we about had both Lino seen here. a show called The Glass of the Caesars, which the Corning Museum put together, which was a show of ancient Roman glass. The thing about that glass is it's uh, was compelling to both of us because it's so crude and so uh, imperfect, not just because it's been, you know, devitrifying for thousands of years or hundreds of years, it has a looseness about it in the way they would attach handles and and leave the lip of a vase or something like that. They didn't, their purpose wasn't to make it perfect, perfect. It was to make a vessel for, for functional reasons. Okay, so um, so you saw just the beginning of this. If I if I go in a little bit further, well, what I should mention, first of all, is he's talking about a show at the Corning Museum of Glass, which was called Glass of the Caesars. Um, and that show, um, we ended up, we, we focused on in the Corning page. I don't know if we'll have a chance to get to it, but if you want some more information about Glass of the Caesars, go to the Corning page. There's quite a bit of information and some great images. My feeling was, uh, I liked the idea that we were doing these videos and, and these narrations, and, and we were able to speak to various people about um, these artists. But I also felt like, um, and Jesse, yeah, Jesse right. and Randy did as well, what if somebody doesn't click on the video? Then what happens? Then we're losing all that, all, all these great images. And so what I ended up doing is going back and sort of filling out with, with some of the, the best images so that you're, you're able to get a chance to see them if you don't have a chance to watch the, you know, a 30, 20 minute, 30 minute video. And so we have these again, carousels of slides where you can see some of, some of these images. And in this case, um, there was only one image that, that Dan Daly was in, which is this one. And he's on the right up here on the, on the upper left-hand corner. So just so you know that, um, and more quotes. And again, as Kristen mentioned, um, there's always a piece that they donate um, to the museum. Um, and this is that work, the Kelowna from 1989. Um, if you watch the video, you'll see other pieces that they made for this, um, for this demo. Um, and they're, they're really quite interesting and fascinating. Um, so take a look. Um, and also, you know, as I mentioned before, sometimes you get these transcripts here, so you can actually just click on it on this. This is an this is an interview that I mentioned this earlier that Dan Daly did for Paul Hollister. So you can read this. This was a, this incredible interview um, that he did in his car on his daughter's uh, young daughter at the time's 
taped recorder and it actually sounds great. And it's such a great interview. I, it's really probably one of my favorites. So if you have a chance to read through it, it's really amazing. It talks a lot about his time at Benini. Um, it's really, um, really moving, I would say. Um, okay. Ooh. Okay. Um, and also again, um, another example of these full page um, images, this one unfortunately isn't as big, but um, of, of, the, um, of the article. So you get a chance to see kind of what these articles look like and more examples of, of the work too. Um, okay. And then just a little bit about Wheaton Arts now, name change and, and so on. Um, so that is the page and we do have a little bit of time. So I could, and I, I guess I'm gonna ask either Kristen or Catherine if there's anything I can I can show other pages. We could we could do questions. What would be best? I'm happy to show a little bit more of a page and then go to questions, or we could go to questions now. Whatever makes sense. So yeah, maybe if you just want to scroll through yeah. um, some of the other other sites, I do I do want to just I'll make a I have to make a quick plug if that's okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Paperweight Fest. We are still um, as you said, it's still um, an event that we have. Um, Again, COVID uh, kind of threw a wrench in things, but we are moving forward with a virtual paperweight fest and that's coming up in May. Um, I think it's maybe the 15th, 16th. Uh, so please check out our website for more information and to register. Again, it will be virtual. So um, no lobster bisque, unless you provide it for yourself in front of your own computer, but we will have, um, you know, again, we'll have great lecturers and some demos. Uh, what I do know that in our studio, our studio um, tech Skitch Manion is working with Don Friel and Dave Graber to make the world's largest Millville Rose. So they've got a new crimp made that's larger than anything um, we've ever seen. Um, and so they'll be demoing that. Um, so definitely check out our website for more info um, to continue to attend the Paperweight, Paperweight Fest um, again, it's artists, collectors, curators, um, and all interested people in anything and everything paperweight. Great. Yeah. I'm going to try to definitely figure out a way to go to some of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Just really quickly, since there aren't questions yet, and, um, and Catherine, if you had something, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about um, Hollister's archive, both you know, in terms of the slides and the teaching and the writing is it really led us to um, having a better understanding of the interaction between pseudo glass, paperweight making, factories. I think, I think when we think of studio glass, we tend to hive it off, right? Into sort of the pilchucks or the penlins or whatever. And and through, you know, going through his material and archives, we realized, wow, Wheaton's really important. Blanco's really important. And these things, these places that weren't maybe necessarily, you know, the sort of part of the received narrative really merited um, attention. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually I know um, that work that Dan Daly did with Lano Tagli Pietra, um, I'm pretty sure he cold worked that and finished it up, did the sandblasting and stuff out at Blanco. Um, so it's interesting because he he and Lino, you know, worked at a variety of, of studios including Wheaton um, and then yeah, Dan would yeah. finish them off and then add that um, painting on it um, to sort of add so the the sandblasting added an interesting texture that he was referencing kind of the frescoes yeah. he saw in Italy yeah um, so yeah. yeah so even in those works you know the, the piece that you showed a picture of that's on display currently in the museum like you know that's touched <laughs> a number of these spots that you have highlighted yeah. Um, yeah. on the website yeah I think that he worked at Fenton so I'm wondering if it could have been Fenton, but, um, but it, West Virginia for sure, and possibly Blanco. And if it was Blanco, I would love to know that. Maybe it was. <laughs> because uh, we could add that information into yeah. the Blanco page. But um, using my uh, West Virginia factor. Yeah, but, but, yeah I think it might've been Fenton, but um, yeah, no, that's, we, we learned a lot about Blanco and, and just fa how factories were integral to, um, to the, well, not to get too far into it, but into the making of, um, careers really. I mean, Blanco, um, we could go to that page too, but we were talking about this a little earlier today with Catherine, but the idea of, of, of large glass factories um, giving Cullet away to universities, um, that was something that people talked about a lot. And, and oftentimes uh, I was saying this earlier, it was because an artist worked at a factory 
And then that's how that happened. Because it wasn't so much the factory workers or the upper management was like, yeah, we're going to donate this stuff. They maybe, maybe were, but the artists that we interviewed said it was usually, you know, um, Joel Philip Myers sent Richard Ritter, you know, a bunch of, of co-it. And so that's how that, or, or, or co-it, color, um, that's how that happened a lot of times, which I thought was interesting. Um, I just wanted to show you guys this um, New York Experimental Glass Workshop slash Urban Glass page, um, because I think it's it's one of my favorite pages as somebody with a contemporary uh, modern art background. Um, and uh, I just, I think it visually is really nice. And just the story of, of Urban Glass is really interesting. Um, and I wanted to mention, which I, I didn't earlier, um, I don't think, but we also got a lot of never before seen or published images from the artists themselves. Um, we got the, um, the Richard Yell uh, and Joe Upham are two of the co-founders of New York Experimental Glass Workshop, and both of them gave us a lot of images. Um, Joe Upham, who I, I interviewed with Richard, um, just an early early in the year, January, February, um, suddenly unearthed all these slides. I mean, he knew he had them, but just scanned them and sent them to me, you know, and slides of Totsinski, Dale Jahuli, William Morris, Totsinski um, being filmed uh, for a television program. Um, and, she, and she used to work at, at work in, in her early days at, at Urban Glass, or then New York Experimental Glass Workshop, but uh, really nice stuff. This this was one of the only ones of the set that was published, but none of these have really ever been seen. This three two one contact um, TV shoot. I don't know if you any of you remember that show, but um, but yeah, I was really impressed at at what they had. Um, and also, I the interview that I did with them is here. And if you take a look, there's many many more images in the interview as well that we didn't publish on the site per se, but in the interview. So take a take a look at that if you can. And I, I should show you, and more again, original, nobody's seen these images. Really great one of Thurman Statham um, and uh, June Kaneko. Um, uh, New York Experimental Glass Workshop used to be um, shared with, uh, with Clayworks. Um, this was uh, when they were located on Great Jones Street. Um, and so Richard Yell talks a lot about those early days when they shared the space, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, a little bit about new work, um, the magazine, the journal um, published by New York Experimental Glass Workshop, Now Urban Glass. Um, this one has a big long article box. Um, and this again was, um, these are all Paul Hollister um, uh, articles. Um, that's one of the probably the longer ones that we have. Um, lots of great information about Mulberry Street and images that we got from James Harmon that we were really happy to get from making work. Some images of Paul Hollister that Paul Hollister took of Gianni, Gianni Toso, who was a regular at uh, Urban Glass at one point. Um, and also we were talking about this this morning, but one of the things that Catherine really wanted to do, which I think is really a, a great idea, was, was to show Im images of work that was actually made at the, the, the location. So in this case, this is a work by Mike, Michael Ashenbrenner um, that was made in 1989, and he made it at New York Experimental Glass Workshop, and he was a regular, made these, made the work there. Um, and this is a piece in the Corning Museum. So um, we were able to get, uh, and by searching uh, through the Corning site, we were able to find, um, okay, which pieces were made at Pilchuck, which pieces were, pieces were pieces were made at New York Experimental. And then I was able to correspond with Michael Ashenbrenner about the piece. So um, so think little moments like that, I think were, I think worked well. Um, and we do have more of those videos of Paul Hollister, um, uh, Paul Hollister slides uh, and other people being interviewed. So, um, and Paul Hollister's here on the right. Um, we have a video, these are some slides that Paul Hollister took of a, a, a Del Chulis Machia series. Um, and again, I wanted to make sure people were able to see the slides and not just have a video, but the video, um, here's a carousel slides. Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but another video here. We wanted to make sure that people had a chance to uh, see the images as well as watch the video. This is an interview with William Morris and with Paul De DeSoma that we did separately and where they're sort of narrating what's happening in the Machia. Um, and then we also have one that we did for the Venetian series, which, um, which came a little bit later. This is a transition moving from uh, Manhattan um, to Brooklyn, uh, Urban Glass was located in Manhattan, two different locations in Manhattan before they moved to Brooklyn. And so actually most of the site is about there. 
uh, Manhattan location, but the uh, Venetian series workshop happened in their current location in Brooklyn very early on. They were still called New York Experimental Glass Workshop at the time. Um, another uh, Hollister article with a very early Venetian. I believe it's a Venetian. I'm calling it a Venetian um, over here. Um, I don't know. Is there, are, is there a video, Catherine, that you would like me to play or? Um, yeah, I mean, I just love that quote. Um, but I also think, you know, just to, you know, what Barb's saying also is that, you know, we thought about the questions we wanted to ask uh, the people we're interviewing. And one of them was, what drew you to glass? Why glass? And several people said it's magic. I think they said, yes, it's the fire and the smoke and the drama and all that, but also that the material itself um, had these kinds of almost kinds of um, these qualities that they couldn't quite put their finger on. Um, and that, that was really lovely. Um, yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, I agree, definitely, that was great. Um, and as we're waiting for questions, I'm just gonna, Corning is also a really great uh, page. So I'll mm -hmm. go through that. If there's any, it, you know, it, that's a good question, Marcy. And it, it would be really hard for me to pick one video. Um, right. I'll do one of James Carpenter, why not? Before there, he he uh, talks very softly. So it, on glass and film installations. And that coincided with some work I did at Corning on photosensitive glasses. So I got invited to go to work at Corning. Which I did for seven or eight years. Uh, so, and that introduced me to obviously a much more technical level of glass making. And I worked with a really terrific person there, fortunately, uh, who invented glass ceramics. And, and uh, so I learned a lot. He was very generous with his time. But those are those are really good, and uh, it's great that we had those. We interviewed Susie Silber um, from Corning, um, the Corning Museum of Glass, and. Um, she had a lot of great things to say. And of course, she's a BGC alum. So we were really great. It was really, we were really pleased to have her. The, the showing Jamie Carpenter, that's also, you know, you mentioned uh, before sort of how through this project, you learned um, a little more about those links between the industry and mm -hmm. the art studios. Um, and so he's, he, to me, to me, he's a good example of, of someone who really just, um, organically embraced all of those different aspects, whether it's architectural glass or, you know, studio art or factory design for um, decorative arts, you know, and he, I felt like he really goes between all of those without really having these boxes right, right. that he's yeah. putting himself in. And that's what I found the, at least in my experience, um, you know, which is um, more recent, that the, it's the, uh, the artists don't necessarily put themselves in these boxes, um, you know, so I'm not, you know, it's sort of interesting the way, you know, you mentioned in the New York Times, Hollister's work was originally published in the home section, you know, which speaks to the decorative arts background of the glass before it got moved to the, the art section. So it's, it's always interesting to me, these different, um, Again, sort of boundaries that are placed and who places them and who crosses them. Um, I, do you have any more, you know, any other artists or, or places you looked at that sort of made you think about how they about that. those lines? Yeah, um, I think, I think we thought ahead, about, Yeah, I think we thought about that a lot. And I think with Jamie, I think what we didn't realize was, I mean, I was more familiar with his work as an architectural glass designer, but I mean, Hollister knew him from the early 70s and you know he did this article in the 1990s but um James Carpenter remembers talking to him about like this kind of obscure glass shop um in New York yeah. City that then later went out of business and, and it was just okay there's a really long history here and there's a trajectory right of where people are and where they end up um, and it's, it was interesting to us to see about how, how Hollister fit into that and how he remembered him. Um, and then, you know, to hear him talk about his own work, which um, has a whole different cast in terms of, um, you know, his work as an architectural designer. Yeah, yeah. Sydney Cash talked about that same, um, now I'm going to forget the name of it, and I'm sure some of you glass people out there know, but I, I, can, I can think of it if I... Yeah, if I, I Leo, Leo Popper. Leo Popper, yeah. That was also talked about by Sydney Cash, was also a big fan of Leo Popper. 
Um, I just, because you mentioned um, James Carpenter, I was gonna um, just show the RISD page because he's also featured quite a bit on the RISD page. Um, here's Howard Bentray. I just got this from his widow, actually, this great photo of him. Um, Another thing I should mention too is that we really tried to have as many women involved as we could. And as you can see, there's a lot of men in these images, but we really, really tried to incorporate women wherever we could. Um, uh, luckily, we got we have a lot of great um, video um, from Titsinski and some great photos that she sent us. Um, we talked extensively over email from Kate Elliott. She sent us some great photos as well, and she was really important. Um, there were another, another thing I should mention is we've lost quite a few people since we started this project. Um, Michael Glancy passed away. We interviewed him. Um, that was very, very sad. Um, we were lucky to get some, in, some images from his family after he passed away. Um, Carol Cohen uh, was also somebody that um, Hollister did a recording of a lecture that she gave for Heller. Um, and um, she's no longer with us. Um, uh, Geraldine Casper passed away, um, who's also really important um, to the paperweight um, scene. Um, and I'm I, Howard Bentray, of course, passed away really recently. Um, and Sylvia Vigiletti also passed away. I was I was lucky enough to talk to her briefly. Pollister interviewed her um, at a paperweight show. Um, and I spoke to her uh, maybe six months before she passed away, if even. So, um, so we did definitely, we were lucky to get, have the conversations that we did um, and have that archive, you know, of these, of, of these people. I was gonna try to get to that, some of the Jamie images. Uh, we also did an interview with Toots and Thurman Statham, um, which is a really, um, really fun one. Really getting to the, lots of stories about them first meeting and what it was like back in the day um, at RISD. Uh, there's Kate Elliott on the left here. Um, Kate Elliott, um, she uh, was at Pilchuck and then invited to come to RISD to work with, um, to work with Dale Chihuly. And then um, later um, after he had his accident, um, his car accident and had only a sight, uh, lost a sight in one eye, um, she became sort of but they back then they called it the secretary of the department, but she was really instrumental in, in every aspect of, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I almost want to say his career. I mean, she was very, very helpful. And a lot of people have, have talked about uh, how important she was um, in his career. Um, we also talked to Mary Schaffer extensively. Um, she had two um, children um, that were running around the Rissy Glass stop shop um, who are, course very much grown now um, but we talked extensively with her this is one of Mary Schaffer's work she was a conceptual artist she was also a glass artist so a lot of her work had kind of a danger element um, and Chihuly and Carpenter their collaboration so this is kind of what Catherine's talking about too I mean this is this is Jamie Carpenter here um, so almost unrecognizable but these old photos of of him with Dale working together on this these, uh, this really important uh, work that they did at the um, Museum of, what is the museum? What was it called then uh, and now? At, at that time, it was the Museum of Contemporary Crafts. It's now the Museum of Arts and Science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so that's this piece that we talked about here. And uh, the Corning uh, Wall is here. A really uh, early piece, a collaborative piece that they worked on beginning at Pilchuck and later at RISD. There was a lot of crossover between the two. And you know more articles that Paul Hollister wrote. Um, Paul Hollister also interviewed Edward Larrabee Barnes um, and James Carpenter. And this is a great interview here, a quite long one, um, but definitely worth taking a look at. They, um, they collaborated on a church. Um, uh, James Carpenter did uh, the window you need to read about it and take a look. It's, it is really quite incredible. And James Carver used to work at RISD's Nature Lab. If anybody has heard mm -hmm. about this, this is a sort of a natural history lab that still exists. And he uh, took it over after the, the woman who ran it retired. And he, he talked about it in his interview. And so we have that recording. Um, here's the Nature Lab on the left now. Here it is back then when uh, Jamie was, was uh, overseeing it in the 70s. Uh, and this is very sweet, um, Michael Glancy. Um, sort of a photo, let's see, was 2017, so not that long ago when he was still alive. So 
you know, from someone who does work on the kind of the museum side of the glass world, this is such an incredible resource um, that you've pulled together that is readily accessible to all of us, not just um, those of us who are lucky enough to get um, paid to, um, to work on this, but also um, those who are collectors, um, people who are just interested in all of this. Um, and I'm, I especially appreciate that it pulls together these, as you mentioned, these sort of disparate seeming um, threads from the different studios, the different educational institutions, the different um, you know, factories and how it all kind of blended together um, in the special form that created the American uh, studio glass movement. And then you get the sort of like Lino and that Italian um, influence coming in. So um, I just wanna congratulate you on this amazing, amazing project. Again, as someone who works with archives, I, gosh, this is an, such an incredible amount of work. Um, and I'm so happy that you have done it because I know I will benefit greatly from it. So um, not a question, but just a sincere mm -hmm. thank you um, for, for doing all this and shepherding this into existence and doing all of the amazing, um, you know, all of that, cleaning slides and scanning slides and identifying the people and calling their families and getting more photos. And I mean, that's just, it's just really incredible. So thank you. That's, that's Kristen, uh, thank you for bringing that part up. And I wanna thank you for this website. And um, I, can you say again, how long, when, when was this originally started? Um, when was the project actually started? And does everybody know, um, I, I just want to make it clear, like it just launched. So how, so I'm going to follow up my question with, how do you feel now that um, it is, uh, and I know you've, you mentioned several times that um, it's not necessary, like it, this may work or, this, but I've, I have found that it's very user-friendly. I've um, spent quite a bit of time um, and I know that you, that you have, um, that the developers are still working out some of those Chrome issues, but um, it is, it is a beautiful site. And I hope you, and I know you've taken some time and I hope you really are a, a, getting to bask in the glow of that pride right now but how long did it really take um well I'm going to answer part and then I'm going to have Catherine uh, chime in too because my portion my portion started in about 2016 so I'd say five years but there was talk before that of 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 trying to create something with these slides but Catherine had really been working with Irene much earlier so I don't know if you want to talk about that as well, Catherine? I mean, sure. I mean, I think, you know, these these projects kind of morph over time. And, you know, Irene first, I mean, Irene passed away in 2016. Um, and um, I was talking before, but she first approached me around sort of the so-called 50th anniversary of Studio Glass. So if that's 1962, then it's 2012. Um, and, you know, honestly, I didn't really, I mean, I teach about post-war craft design, but I really didn't know much about Paul Auster. Um, and you know, I, was, I was a little reluctant um, and issues were persistent um, and it just turned into this wonderful project. And I think, you know, it started out as a book project, right? Here's an anthology, all right, like a contextual essay, it'll be great. Um, but it was gonna have a small audience. And so I think when Barb started working on the idea that these slides would be a digital exhibition or could be the foundation of that, obviously it's so much more, then it just seemed sort of, of course, we should merge the projects. Um, uh, but I mean, I think also not only that it's a long time in development, but the, that the sort of conceptions of it changed over time. And we're very fortunate to have um, financial support from Irene and our institution um, to sustain that process. Because it, it takes a village, right? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And I was going to say too, um, the site, um, it, we still haven't, although we have, it's launched, we've had a couple of these launch programs now, it's not sort of officially launched, launched yet. Um, so everybody who attended, of course, will be able to link to that. And I think once all those kinks are ironed out, then they will be officially launched. Um, but um, 
and I actually don't know when that will be, but um, but it, it's going to happen. There's a couple of of, of additional uh, some additional material that will be on the site too. Um, some essays that Catherine's writing on on Paul Hollister as well, which we're really looking forward to. So um, so even more than there is now, which is great. So yeah, that's that's great. Well, um, did you guys uh, have any final words you wanted to wrap up with or? Um, I just to say thank you for allowing us to talk about the project. Uh, as you can see, we're very, you know, um, into all the details of it and just really excited about it. Um, and it's really lovely to be able to share it. And I appreciate your asking us and to our audience, thank you for sticking with us. Um, and, you know, again, we're, we're happy to share it and, and talk to you more. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and I would say to um, any of the paperweight artists uh, that I know or people that I don't know, if they have questions and want to email me, um, you should do it. Um, I'd be happy to hear any of your comments, even criticisms. I mean, we just want to know, uh, you know, it, if there's something missing, or um, we'd love to we'd love to hear, um, and especially from the paperweight artists because um, there there was such a uh, for me, very uh, something I did not know anything about, and it was such a joy to talk to them. And um, I, I think they're really important. So um, I'd be happy to hear from them. Absolutely. So on that note, I um, have shared the screen and make sure I'll, I'll make sure is it, it uh, everyone can see your um, your email addresses here now and I did share the uh, link to the site um, the the sneak preview of, of the site um, in in the chat and if anyone needs um, needs that again you can reach out to either Catherine or Barb um, Kristen before I don't want to cut you off um, did you want to close with anything at this point uh, no, just um, I encourage everyone to, um, you know, check out the site. I, I will warn you that it is um, an internet rabbit hole and you will find yourself hours later um, being like, oh man, I've been <laughs> exploring all these because it just links and then links to something else. And then, and then you're reading an article and you're listening to an interview. So it's, it's just spectacular. So I just encourage everyone to spend some time um, just exploring. It, it really is. It's um, it, you. You get the same satisfaction of a, a really good book too. I like the the rabbit hole analogy, but I, I just it's it is a wonderful content and feature rich um, website that um, that you just you you feel like you're getting to know. Um, the history and and the people involved in that history, and I hope um, that you and everyone that are involved are intensely proud. And thank you so much with, for sharing with us today. Um, I again will drop these uh, the emails into the the chat, and I did share the link. Um, and let's see, I did want to touch again on the Bolivian ritual and dance. And I did, that is, um, you'll, it, it's going to be an exciting conversation with the Bolivian art, artist Julia um, Garcia and Maria Meda, um, uncovering the unique stories behind the Bolivian rituals and dances in the context of Bolivian and more broadly and Andrian, Andrian traditional culture. Um, so keep your eye out for that. And um, thank you for being here with us this evening. And thank you, Catherine and Barb and um, Kristen. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>